birthday. Thank you so much, Keanu. It was an amazing gift this morning. Hello, friends. Let us pray. Let us be still. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be accept to you, acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The text for today is well known to American Protestants, especially those who value justice and the liberatory message of the gospel. Jesus confronts the inequity and injustice running rampant in the temple, dedicated and hollowed to his father. Jesus forcefully ejects the money changers and con artists from the holy place. We know from the historical record that the grounds of the temple were infested with graft and double dealing. Worshippers were charged unfairly to purchase sacrifices or exchange their nation's tender for that in use in Jerusalem. Often these grifts took place after long, arduous, and expensive journeys, leaving supplicants with few options for honest dealing or for turning back. Protestants have referred to the cleansing of the temple in our theological and ethical discussions of Christ and his mission for hundreds of years. Zwingli, Calvin, John Wesley, and Luther used the tale of Jesus' indignant rage and direct action to justify the movement away from the indulgence system and corruption of the dominant church of their time. In many ways, Jesus' cleansing of the temple acts as an example to all of us to take a stand for the oppressed in opposition to existing power structures, which only served us the further hierarchies and domination. This story also has a sense of satisfaction to those of us who advocate for justice both within and without the, the Christian tradition. It offers us definitive proof that Jesus was steadfast in his dedication to improving life now, for changing things now, for advocating forcefully now. Jesus was not a pie in the sky thinker. Instead, he was an active and committed exemplar of economic justice. But there is a real danger in taking satisfaction in this story of the cleansing when we make the mistake of disassociating the single narrative from the larger story of Jesus's mission. The arm of overturning of the tables was not an isolated incident in Jesus's ministry. It is, an, it is important that we investigate the larger context of the Christian conception of just action. All of the gospels affirm that the confrontation in the temple took place after Jesus was explicitly called and named by God. Matthew, Mark, and Luke insist that Jesus's time in the wilderness predates his ministry in a very important and strategic way. Before Jesus took action on behalf of the oppressed, he had to undergo a trial and spiritual cleansing. Jesus had to confront the sinful urgings of his own heart and the inherent power of his positionality within the created order. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted, confronting his own humanity in the face of pain and uncertainty. We can imagine Jesus in the wilderness, searching his heart for signs of God's will, straining to hear the voice of his father. During Lent, we metaphorically reenact this harrowing time in Jesus's life, his spiritual journey and his ministry. The ashes remind us of the literal humanity and humility embodied in our aliveness, humus, meaning of the earth and the root of both humility and humanity. In short, Jesus had to do the inner work of investigating his own moral claims and come to embrace his calling. God lowered God's self to participate in our humanity. We cannot forget Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf 
And we cannot forget that this sacrifice came before the act of crucifixion. Jesus' sacrifice began when he took on the mission of walking in the fullness of humanity and investigating his soul's duty in the salvation of God's creation. Investigation is a concept which has a long history in Christianity. It refers to seeking signs of God in the wilderness of our lives, the vestigial remnants of God's passing. The wilderness has often served as a metaphor for the dangers and darkness which often surround our spiritual journey through the world and our innermost selves. This sort of inner investigation is bitter work filled with terrors, temptations, and traps. It is important to our understanding of justice and action that we hold the complete story of Jesus in our hearts. And remember that the inner work of coming to God precedes the worldly action of confronting the money changers. We should also remember how Jesus' journey, inner reconciliation, and ministry is mirrored in the contemporary justice movement so important to the sacred mission of Hyde Park Union Church. And why we can't wait, Martin Luther King Jr. outlines the contemplation and spiritual cleansing that took place before volunteers would be allowed to take part in sit-ins and marches. King writes that volunteers committed to be used by God in order that all might be free. To be useful to God, one had to cleanse their intentions of hubris and self-regard. All of this is adapted from Howard Thurman's understanding of Gandhi's justice work and the need to cleanse our inner tabernacle. In Jesus and the Disinherited, Thurman describes the inner tabernacle as the holy place inside us all that is directly connected to the, to the divine and which helped to set our intentions in accordance with God's will. Before we seek to cleanse the temples of the world, we have to cleanse and set right the inner temple, which defines who we are in relation to God. The holy text demands that we make straight the way of the Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, he not only carried with him the righteousness and the anger of God, Jesus also carried the humility of the wilderness, confronting temptation and the call to wield the power of domination. Jesus used the wilderness to clarify his mission, to come into his calling. I believe that all the healings, empathy, and wisdom of Jesus as the Christ is rooted in the trauma of the wilderness. You can't just move on from the experiences which shape us which turn us into the persons that we are and find the faith that we embrace. We can't just move on from the desolation, which gives rise to our sense of mission and justice. We can't just move on from the inner investigation, which provides context for the holy rage we bring to bear on the injustices of the world. Jesus never left the wilderness or abandoned the inner work. His indignation was justified. After driving out the money changers and the livestock and the pigeons that was turning the temple into a marketplace, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. He was speaking of the temple of his body. The outer work of making sacred the temple coincided but the work of making oneself a hospitable place for God to enter and to dwell.
When I first moved to Hyde Park, I was eager, eager to access the university's library system. Books are the tools I use in my daily work of investigation and understanding. I received my student ID and selected a few books, put on my noise canceling headphones and settled in for a long afternoon of reading in my new home. I did not realize that the library was on their summer break schedule and that the closing time would not match the hours posted on the library's doors. As the sky grew darker, I became engrossed in the text I had selected. So when I felt the tap on my shoulder, I was naturally startled. I turned to see two armed police officers with their hands on their holsters. I think it was the surprise on my face combined with the obvious fact that I had not heard their orders that saved that moment from becoming even more charged than it was. All three of us relaxed after a few seconds of awkwardness as I removed my headphones and explained that I was a new student. This of course was not my first heightened experience with police officers. I remember the first time I was searched for weapon when I was 13 and perhaps ironically headed to the library. Something about my appearance, the way I walked with the loaded backpack or the neighborhood I was in, I always journeyed to the better neighborhoods in search of the best books, made me a suspect, a person to be feared and interrogated despite my age. I remember sitting in the back of the police car as they rifled through my bag. I remember praying desperately that I would not flinch or show disrespect or somehow cause them to be grow angry with me. I carry the fear and injustice of that moment with me. When I was startled in the library 20 years later, that old trauma rose within me. Many of my classmates view Hyde Park as an island of safety within the ocean of violence that plagues the bad parts of South Chicago. During orientation, we were cautioned not to go too far below the midway or on the other side of Washington Park. But I must admit, when I walk around this neighborhood, I am often filled with anxiety. There are so many armed police officers patrolling and they are taught to view me and people who look like me as a threat. My experiences walk with me. So I've never felt safe in Hyde Park. I can't just move on from the traumas and experiences that make me who I am and that contextualize the justice I advocate for in my ministry and scholarship. But I refuse to allow the terrors of the wilderness, the displays of racism, domination, which affect all persons on the margins of society. I refuse to let these terrors set my intentions. I recall the holy rage of Jesus and how his experiences reinforce his mission to set my mind right. I can't move on from the history of my people in America, but I can investigate it. I can search for God in the darkness. In the second hour today, we will discuss the talk that Dr. Reggie Williams delivered to our church a few weeks ago. In that talk, he discussed white supremacy and the racial script that we are all born into and that sets the boundaries for how we interact with one another. This racial script is a traumatic experience that all of us carry. It desecrates our intentions and makes our inner tabernacles unsuitable to the indwelling of the divine. I would ask that you do the work of driving out the injustice and inequity inside our own beings as we do the work of God. As our verse today states, Jesus' disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed. Listening rather than only hearing, the message of God is an intimate act of discipleship. 
It is a necessary and divine act of ministry, which is connected to the actions we take on behalf of the oppressed and in accordance with the gospel message. I want to linger on this point for a bit longer because it is often difficult to align our own ur urgings for change with the cries of the oppressed. Listening is an art. During this sermon, I have emphasized the need for the faithful to do the inner work of listening for God's voice in the wilderness of our souls. But I need to add that this work of listening extends to all of God's creation. Are we as Christians listening to the earth as it wells for our empathy and care? Do we, often as those privileged with the responsibility of living out the gospel message, attend to the cries of the oppressed. Two years after the Was riot and presaging the volatility of the Vietnam era, King said, a riot is the language of the unheard. As Dr. Williams pointed out, white supremacy teaches us to place the desires, feelings, and motivations of the dominant class over the honestly expressed reality of those whose backs are against the wall. White supremacy lives inside all Americans because we are all exposed and reared in a racial script which supports the degradation of our humanity. The living word of God has the power to rewrite this script. We do this through the work of accepting the testimony of those in need and attending to their narratives. Yes, Jesus whipped the thieves from the temple but this action was not taken to satisfy his own need to exert his power. This action was undertaken through the commitment to live out the will of God and serve those who were being unjustly treated. Jesus knew hunger and want, the desperation of a long journey toward God, and he refused to allow this pain to go unanswered. The intentionality of the wilderness found expression in the temple. We are called to the commitment to hear one another and believe one another. Our work of justice concerns all of God's creation, including our own minds and hearts, our church, and our neighborhood. I related my experience with law enforcement and a sense of unease I feel when I walk the streets of Hyatt Park because I want to describe the wilderness in my own heart and to, and to declare that I refuse to allow unholy rage to guide my intentions. Often we are imprisoned by our own experiences and traumas, by our own need to fix things and seek control. But Thurman King and Jesus teach us that action follows intention. We have a sacred duty to know and understand and do the inner work before we seek to affect the world. Again, this is difficult work the investigation of the self in search of signs of God within our own struggles and desires for confronting the moments we fail to notice the work of God taking place in our lives. But this work contextualizes who we are as a community. There's more to the story of Jesus' holy rage and Christianity must get this story right. I want to leave you with words that have been important to me during my time in seminary and pursuing my doctorate here in Chicago. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. One of the most difficult parts of my academic journey has been the acceptance of knowing what I do not know and coming to have patience to do the work even when it seems overwhelming. We can't just move on from the work of Christianity, the work of salvation. God will complete the work because God made a promise to humanity through the redemption of Jesus as the Christ. As the faithful, we live the gospel message and refuse to abandon the work of justice. 
Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. <laughs>